Thank you, Kim, and good morning. Wow, you got two watchdogs in one morning. <laughs> I'm the one who isn't cute, in case you were wondering. Uh, it's great to be with you on this, the 20th anniversary of HCCA. I am thrilled. Uh, I know I've done this a number of years now, but I am really thrilled to be part of the 20th anniversary conference, the celebration. Uh, that is really a remarkable milestone. I can understand why Roy gets emotional just thinking about it. Uh, this has uh, been a labor of love for him and the staff, uh, the board, all of the members. Now you have over 3,000 people attending. It's just uh, a remarkable growth and demonstrates how mature the compliance field has, has become. Uh, this has been annually called the Institute. I almost think of it more now like an institution. Uh, you know, an institute is formed for a specific purpose, uh, whereas an institution has uh, more gravitas, more permanence. There's a seriousness of purpose uh, to an institution. And I wanted to begin the morning by uh, creating a, a symbol for you of that kind of institutional purpose. Uh, invariably, an institution is, serves a public good, and HCCA certainly does that. And so I wanted to capture that in uh, that great 2,500-year-old classic Parthenon uh, with the majestic columns. And when I, when I see the Parthenon, I think of how valuable compliance is to creating a healthcare institution and a culture of compliance. I picture these columns representing the different disciplines that are required to actually create a culture of compliance, with perhaps one column being the compliance office itself, but another column being billing and coding, another column being the clinical expertise, uh, the administrative staff, uh, the technology people, uh, each discipline uh, creating that structure of permanence and solidity that's required for a healthcare institution. Now, I, I put on the screen uh, a, an idealized version of the, uh, of, of the Parthenon. Uh, the one that you see actually on the screen right now is, uh, is near Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, AKA the Athens of the South. Uh, the original Parthenon actually looks like this. Uh, we still have the majestic columns, uh, but uh, it has been significantly damaged over time. And, and it wasn't damaged because of weather so much or earthquake. It was damaged because some years ago, uh, some people blew it up. And that is always a risk with institutions, uh, that people will either intentionally or thoughtlessly blow up institutions. And one of the tremendous values of our compliance community is that we are really committed to doing everything we can to make sure that our healthcare institutions don't blow up. What we're in the business of doing is building, maintaining, and enhancing healthcare institutions. How do you do that? Well, I've just listed uh, on a slide some of the most important aspects of strong healthcare institutions those that deliver quality care. And of course, ultimately, that's what we're really in the business of doing, is making sure that our institutions deliver quality care. Uh, I, I, note that we're talking about morale and trust and reputation. Very, very important aspects of being able to create and maintain a really effective organization. You know, institutions have taken generally some serious hits uh, in America these days. There are very few institutions that don't poll fairly low, unfortunately. But two institutions generally poll very high. One is the military, as well it should. And in the professions, the nursing profession is highly trusted. 
And maybe you've experienced what I have, that when I meet members of the military, and generally when I meet nurses, I get that sense of selfless service, of pride, of importance in what they do, and it seems to permeate everything about them and about the people they work with. And that is a very important element of building a strong healthcare institution. Reducing costly mistakes, costly in terms of money. Uh, every dollar spent for healthcare is very precious, notwithstanding that our country spends an enormous amount of money on healthcare, three trillion dollars. Almost one out of every six dollars in the United States is spent on healthcare. That notwithstanding, we need to make sure that those dollars are spent wisely and they really spend to enhance the health of Americans. So both from a money standpoint as well as from avoiding harm, compliance is so critical to being able to maintain good, healthy healthcare institutions. And healthy healthcare institutions critically self-correct. Making errors is human. Going back and correcting them, taking action to disclose an error and then correcting it is not an indication of any failure, but is really an indication of success. And I'll get to that more. What does HHS OIG do? Uh, I know that we have some relatively new folks uh, attending. Invariably, there are fresh faces. And I think, by the way, that's what makes HCCA such a vibrant organization, is that you very, very ably combine veterans in healthcare compliance with fresh blood, with people who are new to the field, who are coming in sometimes from allied fields, allied professions. I think that adds a, an important dynamic, especially in a field that in itself is really changing. Uh, HHS OIG, of course, we, we seek to reduce the vulnerabilities that exist for healthcare institutions. Uh, we look to see how we can reduce improper payments in our programs with $60 billion or thereabouts in improper payments in the Medicare and in the Medicaid program, we know that there is plenty of work to do uh, to ensure that those dollars are being spent properly, whether it's fraud related, a simple mistake, or just complications in our being able to actually follow the money appropriately. We need to ensure through appropriate internal controls that we're actually able to account for the precious dollars that are spent. We promote safety and we promote security. Uh, we look at internal controls to make sure that they're working properly. We make recommendations uh, to CMS regularly on how it can do a better job of ensuring that the programs operate safely and securely. We promote quality of care. And again, ultimately, that is what we're about, is delivering quality of care in our healthcare institutions. So when we do work with nursing homes, with adverse events in hospitals, we're constantly looking at what actually happens in our institutions to ensure that we actually are able to deliver the kind of care that people, especially our seniors and our, those who are most vulnerable in our Medicaid programs, are actually being taken care of in accordance with uh, the rules of, of government as well as the standards of the professions. And of course, we hold wrongdoers accountable. Uh, we are an enforcement organization. In fact, you have something of a law enforcement trifecta going on this morning between Levinson and Caldwell and Sheehan. Uh, we're gonna be covering a lot of the law enforcement uh, groundwork uh, of our field. Uh, but it's important that those who uh, would violate the rules uh, need, need to be taken to account. And when we do have violations of the rules, uh, serious, serious harm can occur. Uh, just briefly, uh, we had a case just this past year involving an oncologist in Michigan, Dr. Fada, uh, who treated 500 patients with chemotherapy. None of these patients had cancer. 30 million dollars in false claims and countless lives ruined and in many cases destroyed. 
Dr. Fada uh, is now serving a 45-year sentence. Uh, significant dollars have been returned, but the harm certainly has been done. And it's a, kind of a worst case example, if you will, of what happens when we don't pay attention sufficiently to what's actually happening in our world of required compliance. I want to note for a few minutes the importance of the, uh, the work that we're doing in the field of hospice. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing an alarming trend in beneficiaries and members of their families not even knowing that they've been enrolled in the hospice program. Uh, there have been kickbacks and bribes by uh, doctors and by marketers in hospice. And on the regulatory front, uh, we've seen some serious inappropriate dollars spent on general inpatient services to the tune of over $250 million, according to one of our recent reports. So both uh, on the fraud as well as on the regulatory front, there's important work that we need to do in the hospice area. In prescription drug abuse, uh, we spend an enormous amount of money now on Part D. Uh, 2016 also marks the 10-year anniversary of the implementation of Part D. Part D initially uh, was spending about $50 billion as a benefit. It's now well over $100 billion. And unfortunately, a lot of those dollars are being misspent on painkillers, creating uh, alarming problems in public health. Uh, the opioid abuse is significant in major parts of the country. Uh, we have doctor mills and, and uh, we, we, have, we have pill mills with doctors and with pharmacies that have created uh, significant, significant problems in major parts of the United States. Uh, we have a very useful video, and Sheila, if you can uh, tweet a link uh, to a video that OIG has just issued on oversight of opioids. Uh, we note that in one case, uh, a patient was able to get prescriptions from 16 different doctors, able to fill painkiller prescription at 28 different pharmacies. Uh, those are the kinds of dangers uh, that we are increasingly seeing, uh, not just with particular drugs, but with combinations of painkillers, with opioids combined with uh, antipsychotics and with HIV drugs, uh, create very powerful and very toxic highs. These are the kinds of examples that I think underscore the importance of making sure that compliance doesn't fail. Uh, to learn more about these subjects and others, perhaps some of you were able to catch Rob DeConti of our office, who gave an extensive talk yesterday on uh, issues concerning the, uh, the False Claims Act and related cases. Uh, again, we have another anniversary. The, uh, the key TAM provisions of the False Claims Act, uh, the amendments, were in 1986, so it's actually the 30th anniversary of uh, what's generally considered the health care amendments of the False Claims Act, a very, very important part of our field of law enforcement. Uh, actually, for those of you in the audience who are relatively new to the field, in years past I've talked about the acronym FACES, uh, to ensure that you can remember uh, in a very shorthand way uh, the key law enforcement statutes that involve OIG and CMS, F for the False Claims Act, A for the anti-kickback statute, C for the civil monetary penalties law, E for the exclusion authorities, and S for the so-called Stark Law. Faces, good way to remember those, those five. Worth catching Laura Ellis uh, later in this conference on fraud risks and compliance in hospice care uh, to learn about the, the, at least five different areas that are worth concentrating on when it comes to, to hospice. So we talk about compliance as the better path. Uh, the 20-year 20, 20 anniversary of HCCA, of course, is related to the 20-year anniversary of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. It was that act that really created, in a sense, the, the modern OIG. Uh, OIG itself is also experiencing an anniversary. Uh, it was 40 years ago in 1970. We have so many anniversaries uh, this year. Uh, 1976 was the year that OIG was established in what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, law signed by President Ford. You remember President Ford. 
Uh, those of you who are boomers would remember Gen uh, President Ford, our only president who was neither, who was elected neither president nor vice president and served for two years. Uh, the 1970s, of course, after Watergate, uh, served as a very significant era for the creation of IG offices. And the office for this department was created even before the Inspector General Act created many other OIG offices as well. Uh, over the course of the years, there have been evolving risks uh, involving healthcare fraud cases, and we've seen uh, some major developments in some areas come and then recede, and others take their place. I'm thinking specifically of uh, the infusion therapy and uh, the, uh, the false storefronts that we experienced in Florida in the early 2000s. Uh, that has evolved more to issues you know, involving DME, uh, more to home health and personal care services. We see kind of an evolution of the kind of healthcare fraud schemes that exist in hotspots like South Florida, Houston, LA, and otherwise. We've also seen a change in some of the major settlement uh, areas too, the big uh, fraud cases involving pharmaceutical companies. Those settlements uh, have receded in the last few years as compliance and enforcement have really uh, had a very positive impact on uh, the conduct and the behavior of major drug companies and other healthcare providers who were involved in earlier fraud schemes. To learn more about these and other areas, I would encourage you to, Kate, to catch uh, Kate Matos, who will be talking about strategies to institutionalize compliance, and Gloria Jarman, our chief audit executive, will be talking about strengthening your billing compliance program uh, later this morning. Uh, perhaps some of you were able to catch Andrea Treese Berlin when she talked about lab compliance yesterday. I want to focus specifically for a few minutes on the importance of understanding how we view the, the balance between enforcement and compliance. Uh, we consider the work that we do at OIG very, very key to giving people throughout the industry a sense of where attention should be focused and, and, and how it should be focused. By using the various tools that were encouraged by HIPAA, like this, the uh, compliance program guidance, uh, our fraud alerts, our bulletins, our advisory opinions, all of them available on our website. Uh, you have a very rich collection of resources through which to be able to use your work and share it with colleagues. We have, uh, through the safe harbors that we have been able to promulgate over the course of the years, you, you, you're able to achieve a very fine sense of how exactly one goes about being able to understand the kinds of, of physician hospital compensation issues that you're often asked to analyze and, uh, and view uh, from a legal perspective and bring in necessary counsel and consultants to be able to do your job effectively. We enforce our laws consistent with the guidance that we promulgate uh, in a strong effort to make sure that the law and the guidance that follows from the law is as straightforward and as understandable as possible. We encourage certainly those, uh, those of you who find the advisory opinions helpful uh, to raise issues either through the formal process or Again, one of the great benefits of being at these conferences is to be able to speak at least informally to many of you uh, about our work and about what you're looking for in terms of guidance. Again, one of the great strengths over the course of the last 20 years has been the way you, uh, we've, been, we've come together at these conferences, uh, not only to provide information and education, but to do so in an interactive way. And of course, OIG secures financial recoveries uh, through our administrative work and working with the Department of Justice on a variety of fraud cases. And we exclude bad actors. Uh, one of the most important developments uh, today, and again, I would ask Sheila to tweet the link to this, is uh, the new exclusion guidance. Uh, that we are promulgating. 
uh, to revise B7, which is the permissive exclusion provision. Uh, the, that will be up on our, on our website today. And what is key about this, this new guidance, and it, re, and it supplements uh, and replaces the guidance that was issued back in 1997 initially, uh, is that at this point in the history of our programs, uh, compliance has become such a, mat a mature exercise that it is presumed that healthcare institutions of the kind that we work for will have robust compliance programs. So that is assumed. One doesn't get bonus points for having a compliance program at this point. This is not new. This is well established. But when self-disclosure is involved, when again that self-correcting goes on by our institutions, that is taken note of. That, that is important. There is a presumption that exclusion wouldn't be necessary under those circumstances. Again, making sure that the healthcare institution honors the integrity obligations that come with federal healthcare programs. And self-correcting and self-disclosing means that there's going to be a much wider understanding by OIG about how to approach the exclusion authorities that we have and the assurance that those healthcare institutions that are able to self-correct uh, are given the leeway, are, 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 are given the room uh, to be able to do the self-correction without further uh, imposition of obligations by OIG. And much the same when it comes to corporate integrity agreements. Uh, we're looking these days to hand out to hand more responsibility uh, to the institution and to be able to step back knowing that the institution at this point should be able uh, to solve the issues that it has identified effectively and competently. Now our trust but verify is meant to underscore that we need to tailor our auditing work so that we do the appropriate follow-up to make sure that those areas that do present a serious issues uh, are resolved appropriately. But in this era, after 20 years especially, uh, we should view it as an internal responsibility that more and more we're capable of handling on our own. To learn more about these topics, I would encourage you to catch Lisa Ray, who will be talking about self-disclosures, uh, to catch Rob Penizek, who will be speaking on federal administrative sanctions, and Rob actually heads a unit, a new unit, within our council's office that looks specifically at administrative authorities and making sure that they are enforced effectively. And indeed, that, that unit has, has recovered almost $40 million in the first few months of this fiscal year with the exercise of those administrative authorities. Uh, to catch Susan Gillen on negotiating and complying with corporate integrity agreements. And by all means, catch Felicia Heimer, if you can, on CIAs for skilled nursing facilities and boards. I want to talk br briefly about our current era. I talked about the 40-year anniversary of OIG, the 30-year anniversary of the False Claims Act, the 20-year anniversary of both HIPAA and HCCA. Uh, in this decade, uh, we are looking at significant delivery system reform, and I, I'm, I wanted to note specifically the Affordable Care Act from 2010, and just last year's physician payment reform law known as MACRA. Uh, this era, we're looking at a, a significant paradigm shift in how healthcare is, is delivered and is going to be delivered in the future. Uh, you probably have heard about accountable care organizations, coordinated care, patient-centered medical homes, the idea that we can spread the wealth of good health by making sure that we focus not so much on episodes of care, but on the continuum of care throughout people's lifetimes. So it is important that we understand that that's going to come with new ways of bundling payments and delivering population health management in new ways. Uh, some of the new models that uh, were 
rolled out as part of the Affordable Care Act, even includes, in the case of the Medicare Shared Savings Program, the MSSP, the waiver of certain fraud statutes so that providers can work as teams, can work in a coordinated way, as opposed to keeping an arm's length transaction. Uh, that's going to require a very careful um, following of how the money actually is dispersed by these accountable care organizations. It's going to require a rethinking of how you account and oversee that money to ensure that integrity obligations are not compromised because the False Claims Act remains on the books and is never waived. So it's important as an obligation that we ensure that the dollars being spent on these new models indeed are creating more economic, more efficient, and more effective ways of being able to deliver health care. Last year's macro law is designed to test further new models to see whether we cannot come up with alternative payment models that do the job really effectively. These new models, as well as many of the things that we've done traditionally over these last few years, depend, of course, on robust health IT systems. And there's been a significant public investment in health IT, $30 billion through the High Tech Act earlier in this decade. And of course, what's important about technology, the big data that now allows us to do so much that we couldn't do before, is that it must be complete, accurate, and timely. We must make sure that our data is accumulated in a way that we can use it effectively, and that really tells us what we need to know without compromising privacy uh, and security. And we know through cases like ransomware and the kidnapping of data that there are serious, serious harms that can occur if we're not doing the appropriate internal controls to ensure that our data is protected. We need to constantly be thinking about how the technology piece will work effectively for healthcare providers and making sure that we're approaching our responsibilities holistically. I would encourage you to catch, if you can, Meredith Williams on the new developments in the anti-kickback and the Stark laws, and Amanda Copsey, who will be talking about the risks for post-acute care providers in coordinated care. Thoughts for the future. For the umpteenth year in a row, I was not invited to Davos, Switzerland, so I, didn't, I wasn't able to attend the Global Economic Forum. But all the talk, according to what I read on the internet, was about the new industrial revolution that's occurring from the age of steam to the age of electricity to the age of computers. We now have a new age that's emerging where we fuse the physical and the digital and the biological. And so we're entering an era in which we'll have artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, we'll have bioengineering, uh, biotechnology. And it will be important to be very creative as we move forward in being able to integrate these new techniques, these new tools into our systems while making sure that we keep with our compliance requirements that we can account for these dollars and ensure that they're being spent appropriately. That is going to require creative compliance leadership. And one thing HCCA, among all the many other things it's done over the last two decades, is very good at, is encouraging the kind of creativity that compliance officers inherently have because you deal with so many different disciplines across so many lines that you're able to think very, very creatively about how to make sure that we can actually account for the work appropriately. We need to be thinking not just about the technology, but about the talent that is really required. So healthcare institutions ultimately uh, really depend upon the people, upon us as human beings to be able to keep up with current developments and to work across disciplines uh, to make sure we're getting the job done. And that's why I wanted our last slide to indicate the social media vehicles that can be used to access all of uh, the resources that are available at OIG and to have profiles of people as opposed to buildings because ultimately it's about what we as people bring uh, to this field. Congratulations again on the 20th anniversary and continued success and good luck. Thank you. <laughs>